So hi everybody, um, welcome to the Managing Fatigue webinar and thank you very much everybody for joining. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Julia Newton and Victoria Strassheim um, and thank them both very, very much for giving up their time today. It's a busy time for absolutely everybody at the moment, so we are really grateful. So thank you very much on, half of, on behalf of the POTS UK team. Um, so just to give everybody an idea, the session will run like this. We'll have um, two separate presentations, both of them lasting about 15 minutes. Uh, Professor Newton will start and then Victoria will um, follow with her presentation. And then the second half of the session will be um, live questions and answers. Um, if you can pop them in the chat box as we go, um, so as you think of things, add them in there. And what I will do is I will collate the questions um, throughout the session and then try and cover as broad a range as possible. Um, so we won't answer them in order, we'll answer them, we'll try and group them together and ask them in that uh, format. Um, when the webinar finishes, um, there's a very, very short survey, literally two to three minutes, um, and it's just really helpful for POTS UK if you can uh, fill that in for us. It just helps us to shape future webinars, and also um, there's an option to select, um, give ideas for future topics that we can do, so it's really helpful if you could do that. Um, like I said, it will be recorded and um, added to our YouTube channel, so um, you'll be able to revisit it if you want to, or catch up if you miss any. Um, and yeah, so I'll keep an eye on the um, Q&A and the chat box as we go through. Um, and But I think, yeah, that's enough from me. So I will hand over now to Professor Newton and I hope everybody really enjoys the session. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Joe. Now I'm going to hope the technology works. Can um, you just let me know, Joe, that you can see that? Yeah, that's perfect. Brilliant. So thank you very much um, for the opportunity to come and um, join this webinar today. Um, the team at the Newcastle Hospital's Cresta Clinic includes four of us. So Vicky and myself are with you here today, but I'm also going to go through some of the um, elements of management that the other two members of the team also um, add. Um, so Kate and Vicky are the, the other two people who, who can't be with us today. So um, oh, now my slides aren't moving forward. Technology. Ah. So, um, in terms of setting the scene, this is just a definition of what fatigue is. It's very hard to define, but essentially, fatigue describes that inability to continue functioning at the level that you would normally be able to or like to function at. Um, and you can either be acutely fatigued, i.e. it comes on very suddenly, often after an acute illness or something um, very specific as a precipitant, or it can be chronic. So it doesn't go away with rest or sleep and it tends to be there for a lot of the time and um, for a significant period of time. So people experience fatigue in lots of different ways. Um, they often describe it to us in a range of different um, uh, ways. It's a feeling of extreme exhaustion that's generally not relieved by sleep. It can sometimes be relieved by rest and it impacts on all aspects of your life. And fatigue is really common. So um, very broadly, fatigue is um, accounting for about a quarter of all primary care consultations. Um, and it's a huge reason for attendance uh, for uh, consultations in primary care. Um, and a UK survey has shown that over 10% of adults have had substantial fatigue for over a month. Um, that's data that was historic and um, currently, of course, with the COVID pandemic, with the recognition that fatigue is a real uh, significant issue with long COVID, reports are increasing with the uh, um, uh, identification and recognition of fatigue. But what about in POTS? Well, this is a survey that we carried out with colleagues from POTS UK. You'll recognise Lorna's name, Leslie Cavey um, and um, Morwenna. And this is a survey of over a thousand uh, members of POTS UK who um, very kindly completed a survey for us about comorbidities that they were experiencing. You can see from this graph that nearly a third of those with POTS described also having a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. They also had a range of other conditions associated with fatigue, um, like joint hypermobility syndrome, vasovagal syncope, and Sjogren's syndrome. 
we did that survey in 2015 um, and at the time um, it was sent out to members of POTS UK and made available on social media and over a very short period of time we got over a thousand responses um, of a group of people who were predominantly diagnosed by a clinician mostly were female um, and mostly were between the ages of 18 to 49 so very representative of the demographics that we generally see um, in a POTS clinic um, but the three commonest symptoms that people were describing um, in the survey was over 90 percent were suffering from fatigue and 90 percent suffered from a dizziness or what we call pre-syncope so a feeling of lightheadedness when you stand up and 86 percent were suffering from palpitations quite surprising to us at the time were that nearly 60 percent of people were also describing syncope and blackouts so what might cause fatigue in pots so why, why might it be so common and why might so many people have been um, diagnosed or labelled with chronic fatigue syndrome in association with their POTS? Well, it might be POTS itself. It might be part and parcel of having POTS as a condition. It may be because of these overlapping comorbidities, common diseases that we often see in people who um, have a diagnosis of POTS. So it might be related to the um, overlap with EDS and uh, it may be that there are um, similarities with CFS. It may also be that it's associated with medications that people are taking for their POTS or perhaps other conditions. And one of the common things that um, we might um, associate with fatigue is beta blockers. And um, one of the medicines that is regularly used um, by people with POTS. But it also might be related to problems with sleep that are often associated with POTS. It might be related to managing a chronic illness while trying to lead a normal life. Um, so, you know, it, all those things, it's important to take in context and think to yourself, why might I have fatigue in association with my POTS? But the positive message is that can things improve? Well, yes, they can. And the approach that we take um, in our clinic is very much a multi-system, multi-professional approach. I'm a medic, Vicky's a physiotherapist, Kate is an occupational therapist, and Vincent is a psychologist, a, a health practitioner. So we, we take a, a multi-professional approach and we look across all various different aspects of you as an individual to see whether or not we can help manage fatigue better. We think about stabilizing and how you need to establish a baseline of activity. And we don't talk about exercise, we talk about activity management in the clinic. And because for some people, just simply um, raising your hands above your head can be exhausting. So the concept of exercise in those kind of um, situations is just a step too far for people. So we think about energy, we talk about a pie of energy and uh, slicing that pie to do the things that you might want to do or that will give you pleasure. We talk about pacing and balancing activities and rest and um, I'll come and talk about the four P's in a few minutes. And we talk about setting goals and making sure that those goals are meaningful and achievable so um, if you set a goal that is unrealistic you're only going to fail um, and it's really important um, to make sure that you are realistic in your expectations of what is possible in a defined period of time and then we talk about slowly grading activity so slowly increasing as and when you've established a baseline and strengthening core muscles with appropriate exercise to help with those positional changes um, that allow you to keep upright. So I'm gonna go through a few slides with Kate's advice. And as I've said, Kate is our occupational therapist and um, she works um, in the clinic with Vicky and I. And these are a few nuggets of information taken from what she um, delivers in her clinic. She talks about this establishing a baseline, the four P's and balancing activities and she really focuses on these goals making them meaningful and realistic 
she very much encourages people to complete activity diaries um, as a visual representation of that balance between activity and rest. And I would really recommend, uh, if you haven't done this, to spend a few weeks just mapping out your activity to give you an idea of um, what activity levels you are delivering and how you are balancing that with rest and sleep. And by doing an activity diary, it allows you to track your activity and begin to identify um, how you manage your activity when you crash and when you have um, activity levels that allow you to function more. It's amazing how often we don't realize how poorly we rest. And it's when you visualize that on a diary that it starts to become clear sometimes how little rest we have and how poorly we might sleep and how when we're resting, it can sometimes only be tiny, tiny proportions of time that we allow ourselves to get well. Um, and this is just to illustrate um, the kinds of concepts that we encourage people in the clinic to begin to think about. We talk about booming and busting and um, this roller coaster of activity where if you do too much one day, you pay for it the next day. And um, essentially, if you think about that pie of energy that you have, and um, if you are booming and busting, you're using up all that pie to do something today which means you have either no pie left for tomorrow or you're borrowing pie from future days. And as a result, you're very likely to crash um, and uh, go into energy debt. And um, so as a result of that, you end up having to spend time recovering. And people will often ask me, how much activity should I be doing? And there's no right or wrong answer to that. Um, but to me, the most important thing is to do something every day that doesn't give you um, consequences the following day. And that can be seconds of activity. Vicky always talks, and she'll um, perhaps talk a little bit more about this, about finding a baseline and knowing what for you is, is that balance between um, rest and activity. And that can be very low for people and can be very frustrating when they may have been used to really high levels of activity. Um, and if you've been ill, um, your baseline is, is much lower than it used to be. And it's about building up from that position back to um, where you can do more of the things that you want to be able to do. So the four Ps um, that Kate often talks about are prioritize, planning, pacing and pleasure. And in order to get to the position where you can achieve the four Ps, you've got to also understand what constitutes rest. So you've got to be able to stop activity that's not always a relaxing experience. So people will often think that they are resting if they're on the computer or on the telephone. And um, Using the computer uses as much energy on occasions as going for a walk um, or doing the hoovering. So be very, very careful um, as to what constitute. Rest means switching off completely. Watching the television isn't necessarily rest. So, you know, meditating and um, making sure that you can actually close your eyes and let the world disappear and you are thinking of nothing. And you know, it's often really difficult for people to manage that or to understand um, what rest is for them. So developing strategies around actively putting rest into your day are things that really can help people begin to manage their boom and bust. And from there, you can begin to build. So once you've got your baseline and you're managing to have active rest and you are making sure that you can plan your activity through the week, what begins to happen is people describe a reduced number of crashes and, a, and less flares up of their symptoms. And as a result of that, they get out of this cyclical activity of booming and busting and then can begin 
to set themselves meaningful goals and begin to grade their activity and allow them to have small increments in, in what they're able to do. So I'll just have a few slides on Vincent's advice. So Vincent's advice um, relates on how we manage illness. And this is not unique to POTS or unique to fatigue. It's very generic advice. But when we're ill, it's really hard managing that. You have to manage yourself and how you're feeling, the frustration and the anger, the disappointment um, about the fact that you're not able to do the things that you wanted to do or uh, have done previously. You've got to manage friends and family's beliefs and their behaviours and expectations, which is often very challenging. And you've also got to manage people like my, uh, so health professionals' beliefs and behaviours. And with POTS, that's particularly challenging because there are not many health professionals out there who have ever seen a patient with POTS or recognise it as a condition, let alone know how to advise you how best to manage it. So in terms of managing yourself, um, we often talk to people about acceptance and that people who um, look at where they are and say, what do I need to do to get better, tend to get better quicker than those who say, I am where I am today, but I want to be like I was a year ago. That constantly looking back and reflecting is energy sapping and, and tends to make people um, struggle to move forward. By accepting, it doesn't mean that you like the place you're in, but it does um, allow you to move forward and allow you to start planning and building and put in place positive strategies to get well. And Vincent always talks um, um, about being kind to yourself and that fatigued patients generally have a lot of guilt and have a lot of frustration about the situation they find themselves in and often get a lot of pressure when they're needing to rest to just pull themselves together that as a result of that they are often not kind to themselves and Vincent is very clear that we need to encourage the patients we see in our clinic to um, get rid of the bad stuff and focus on the good stuff and actually be very kind um, to ourselves and, and positive in what um, we are achieving, not focusing on what we have not been able to achieve. And your mind in this context isn't your friend. Um, your mind will be telling you um, because most POTS people who are fatigued have been highly driven, very able, well-motivated people um, before um, POTS um, occurred, is that your brain will tell you things that you have to say to yourself, actually, that's not true. I need to just allow myself some time to get well. I need to rest and I need to allow that convalescence to get better. And Vincent recommends strategies focused on these kinds of ideas. Think about what your best friend would say to you if you um, were in a similar position. You know, what would they say? You know, how do you want to be judged? What would you say to someone else if they were your best friend? And then don't over worry about things. Don't overthink things or worry about what other people think. Um, and try and spin the whole experience um, positively. So this is your project around convalescence and getting well. And then, you know, when it comes to managing others, focus on those who get it, focus on the, the people who are there for you, not those who are the naysayers who might um, make you feel worse or make you feel guilty. Um, focus on um, those who have positive energy, not those that sap energy from you. So Vincent's summary and, and, and um, a summary in general is that, you know, being ill is hard work and having fatigue is hard work. Um, it is difficult to get 
um, the fatigue better. Um, and it is a challenging um, prospect um, when you're suffering significantly from a symptom like fatigue, imagining how you will ever get back um, feeling well. Um, so it is important to focus on yourself and to focus on that project of getting well. Be kind and get, get around you people who are kind to you and who understand and, and always seek information. And you know, we always point people towards the POTS UK website. Um, so I'm going to unshare my screen now and hand over to Vicky. Thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen. Just while you're doing that, Victoria, that was brilliant. Thank you, uh, Professor Newton. That was really interesting. So we've got lots of nice questions coming through, um, but we'll save them till the end because it might be that they're covered now. So thank you very much. And I'll hand back. I can see it all perfectly, Victoria. So all brilliant. Good. Thank you. Back on. Um, Oh, well, thank you for asking me to speak and thank you to Julia because you just set me up perfectly now. Um, I've tried to make this as broad as I can. I understand that we've got a wide audience and the way you present will look quite different. Um, so some of this might be relevant, some of it won't, but hopefully things will come out in the questions at the end. So I'm going to talk about POTS and fatigue, but activity, because I'm a physio and I'm meant to. But as Julia said, it's not necessarily exercise. So let me just crack on with my first slide, which is about exercise intolerance. I, it took me a long time to realize this, and I will hold my hands up here. And there is an exercise intolerance issue here when we look at POTS. There is a restriction that prevents people with POTS from being as active as they want to be. And it creates these horrible symptoms at relatively low levels of exertion, which are really difficult to manage, that create fatigue, and weakness in your active muscles and that horrible burning sensation in muscles and that increased heart rate and that is what i think i as a physiotherapist have to try and help you to manage and to try and work around because we can't go through it we can't just get rid of it it's just there so one of the first things i try and address with my patients when they come in is to understand what's going on as you move so this person here I've annotated two areas, the hydrostatic column, the area between the heart and the head, and the pooling areas, the area between the heart and the floor when they're standing up. And I always have a prop, I can show you my prop. So I have a bottle of water here. It is 75% filled with red water. It has a heart on it and a head. So when we're in an upright position, our hearts have to pump that blood directly upwards to our heads. The level below our heart, we have to, the muscles and the blood vessels have to squeeze to try and get a little bit more fluid up towards our brains. Can you see that happening? It just squeezes a little bit. That could be fraught with disaster there, but fortunately it isn't. So what happens is when you're upright, that's a hard place to be. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of activity to be there, physiological activity. But if you lie down, that blood just flows towards your brain. So that's a lovely place to be. It's restful. So that's why we see a lot of fatigued patients like to be in this position because it feels calmer and more relaxing. It's where they can rest. But as Julia said, we want you to be doing a little bit of activity every day. So how do we manage that? That really helped me to understand. So I hope it helped you and I hope it came across. At the bottom of that um, slide, there is a link to POTS Dysautonomia International 2016. They've got a lovely animation that shows this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about homeostasis, which is just how all of the systems in our bodies come together, act as little teams to get the job done. They balance each other out. Some systems are more optimised than others. Some work less efficiently, others have to kick in in order to help that less efficient system. So in the case of POTS, we know the nervous system doesn't work quite so well. Those systems where the squeezing of the muscles and the, um, and the blood vessels might not work so well. So the cardiovascular system, the heart has to beat harder and faster to help. So that means the cardiovascular system has to do two jobs. It has to work to help the nervous system and do its own job. 
So that presents that restriction, that exercise intolerance, which means other systems can't work quite as hard as well. So they can't become practiced and become better. Things like the musculoskeletal system, the cardio system, your respiratory system, getting more air into your lungs because you're not challenging it because you can't because of the deconditioning process. So all of those issues there are encompassed in your body that helps to balance and balance at whatever level you can. So the deconditioning vicious circle, it's a horrible word deconditioning. Um, but we know in the presence of POTS and orthostatic intolerance, there is a reduced physical activity. It's not because of sedentary behavior. If you could be more active, you would be, but there's this exercise intolerance in place and we have to work around it. So as we try and move more, we get that hor those horrible sensations. Those horrible sensations, really, you don't want to bum again. So it sort of negates working, moving more. And we know that principle of you don't use it, you lose it. So as you don't move diversely, you don't move more, you reduce movement skill, you, you lose strength, you lose flexibility, you become more stiff, which then makes it worse. You, you don't want to move more because it feels clunky and energy inefficient. That leads on to your reduced cardiovascular capacity and your reduced mitochondria. Your mitochondria are just the, most, the energy batteries that sit in your cells. The more you are cardiovascularly fit, the more mitochondria you have. More Farah is absolutely filled with mitochondria. I, on the other hand, am not, so, not like more Farah. And again, if there was a restriction that I, I felt, I would reduce the, my mitochondrial capacity the same way as I would my muscles. If you don't need it, your body's really clever at using what it needs at that time. And if we've got an exercise intolerance that's forced on us that I don't need as much muscle, I don't need as many capillaries, I don't need my heart to pump as fast in that way. So that leads to deconditioning. But there are things we can do about it if we're strategic. And it all comes down to what Julie has previously said about pacing and rest activity balance and being kind to yourself. So... Julie has talked about pace and behaviours and in clinic it tends to be people come through Kate first and then they come and see me, set them up and then we carry on. We talk about boom and bust a lot, people understand that, but there are many um, pace and behaviours, four of them, and I suspect we're not, I'm just persistent or I'm just avoidant, I suspect we're all of them, but in different ways. So it might be you're task persistent because you like to have your house all tidy and clean, it might be something else. Um, but you keep going until the job's done and then need to recover from it. Task avoidant, I can speak um, from all the patients that come in to see me. Again, Julie has mentioned, putting your arms above your head feels horrible. So you might avoid doing it because it doesn't feel very nice. I know lots of POTS patients who are incredibly dexterous with their feet and we've got really good balance. So they can pick things up off the floor with their feet so they avoid bending because bending feels rotten. Then we've got the task fluctuation, you're having a great day, you've got a list as long as your arm and you're going to get through it. Then you spend days recovering, which as Julia said, we want you to do a little bit every day so we can avoid that deconditioning on the days where you're doing nothing. So where task modification comes in is you recognise your task persistence. I'm not going to do quite as much today. I'm going to just do one room at a time on one day. Do one room one day, one room the next, whichever however it is you do it, task avoidant, maybe a couple of times a week, you're going to reach above your head a few times, feels horrible, get over it and then not do it again for a couple of days. So you're building that in. So you're starting to get a little bit more stretch and building that movement skill back in, but very, very gradually over months, not weeks, but months. Task fluctuation, you're having a great day, but you recognize I'm having a good day. I know I can go too far. I'm going to do just a few things on that list. Then task modification that elusive place to be is when you're recognizing all those things, which takes a long time. And it's particularly difficult when your, your health condition is so fluctuating and unpredictable. And we understand that it is really difficult to get to that point. So when we are talking about planning an activity, I'll often speak about the relationship between the activity and our capability. The activity will have a physical demand and that demand is either greater or less than our physical capability, our ability to do it. So say sitting down, I'm quite good at sitting down. I can do it for a long time. So it's easy to me. It's no problem at all. 
ask me to run a marathon and that's a different matter it's harder than my physical capability i would have to train and i'd have to train for months so in this situation where we're thinking about people who've got an orthostatic intolerance they're intolerant to gravity being upright is going to be difficult and if they're going to be there for a long period of time something's going to have to kick in to allow them to be there and what kicks in is adrenaline and we try and help people not to use adrenaline as a matter of course through their day you don't want to use but adrenaline just to function just to get through your day you want to have the right resources in place but you have to train your body to use the right resources which is why your pacing comes in so let's just talk a little bit about the autonomic nervous system so i'm sure a lot of you understand the autonomic nervous system and know about it but this really highlights what julia was saying about rest if you there's two sides to the autonomic nervous system you're sympathetic where there's a threat that could be emotional dealing with family dealing with people who don't understand it could be physical i have to walk a distance to get to my car and i don't quite have the energy to do it it could be physiological i'm upright against gravity and my blood's being pulled towards my shoes and i need it in my head and i haven't got it there so adrenaline kicks in and that adrenaline helps you to just manage that challenge but it diverts blood from less necessary systems like your digestion your reproduction and your immune system and you don't want that to happen for long periods of time so where we try and encourage you to be more often is in your parasympathetic phase just as julia was saying where you decrease your breathing your heart rate your blood pressure your muscle relaxation so you're resting and restoring and repairing your body every time you have a challenge you break it down it happens when you're relaxed but not necessarily asleep and definitely not while you're watching tv i can get so engrossed in a tv program my emotions can carry along with the tv that's energy is consuming so you want it to be calm and it feels very very foreign it can feel very foreign and it's something that needs to be practiced we are losing this ability to relax but that's where your convalescence happens so before i ask any patients to become more active i ask them to rest to learn to build that skill up again and then i ask them because then i know i can then challenge them so here i'm going to try and use my pointer we have a baseline level of fitness and if you you know if we've got that baseline we recognize pacing we recognize those issues we're stable then we can have a strategic challenge it might be raising your arms above your head a few times it might be bending to the floor you fatigue and you deplete as your body thinks you want me to do this again well i'm going to have to put some infrastructure in and you build muscle and you build um, more capillaries in your heart gets a bit stronger and then you reach a new level of fitness here then we can put a tougher challenge in and this all takes time and practice this tougher challenge happens you fatigue and deplete again your body builds resource and you are on the up you're getting better because where we don't want you to be is in the overtraining curve where if you're unstable here in your baseline level of fitness when we place a challenge in you fatigue and you deplete as your body thinks you want me to do this again i'm going to have to build some resource before you get the opportunity to build adequate resource there's a new challenge put in a new level of fitness and it's not as good as it was before so when if it happens again you fatigue you deplete your trajectory is down and we don't want that the tricky thing is with pots as we start to recognize the challenge is gravity and you can't wake up one day and think i haven't got much energy and we have to turn gravity down we have to modify what we're doing so we have to modify our bodies and it might be on that day we do less or we sit down more and that's how we manage um our energy a little bit more around that problem so this is a slide from professor peter Rowe from baltimore and this oh clarified things a lot for me and i hope it helps you too so there's lots of symptoms around um pots or orthostatic intolerance lightheadedness syncope diminished concentration blurred vision exercise intolerance i'm sure you recognize them all and i'm sure you recognize the breathlessness the chest discomfort tremulousness anxiety the sweating the nausea but what peter rose done is he segregated them and he's given them um he, he's worked out when each happen so the symptoms on the left happen when the blood is coming away from your head being pulled down and that's when the lightheadedness all the way through to the exercise intolerance happens the symptoms on the right are secondary to a hyperadrenergic response which just is a clever way of saying you're using adrenaline here 
and you don't want to be using that for long long periods so what we ask patients to do is to use traffic light remember you're starting to get some of those symptoms on the left hand side you maybe want to lie down you maybe want to sit down you maybe want to elevate your legs have a big drink of water then if you're getting into the hyperadrenergic side, the symptoms on your right, that's the time where you definitely need to stop. You've gone too far. You need to lie down. You need to get your legs in the air. You need to get that blood back up to your heart, into your brain. Okay, I hope that makes sense. It really clarified things for me. So bringing it all together, pacing is really important. You have to manage this within your lifestyle, which is pain. You've got to gain rest activity balance if you can. So use adaptive equipment if you need to. If you want to be able to participate and engage with social engagements that really take it out of you, don't, I, I would never say don't use a wheelchair. Use a wheelchair, use it, use it strategically. You're lowering your base, you're lowering your pooling areas, and you may well be able to use your energy in a different way. So you're taking a tiny, a smaller slither of that pie to be in that social engagement because you're in your chair, which means you've got more energy for the next day. Things like perching stools and um, bath boards and um, shower chairs all help. And I would always recommend them, but use them strategically. Ensure adequate hydration and salt intake. You don't want your body to have less fluid in than it already has. You want it to be filled, plumped up. So you've got more blood heading up towards your brain. Use pressure garments to again help that, that process, squeeze it in. And it's not about doing just one thing, it's about doing lots of things in conjunction with each other to build. Once you're stable or you're getting towards that point, start thinking about increasing your activity. And it might be you're gonna increase your resource in your muscle pump and muscle tone. So wiggling your toes, paddling your ankles, static glutes, static quads, heel raises to really build those muscles up so there's some tone there and they help to act as your pressure garments. And then in conjunction with your pressure garments, you'll get a, a better response. I also say first thing in the morning, have a big drink of water. You tend to be more dehydrated and that just helps the process of getting up out of bed. Challenge the flexibility and um, strength, but you can do that while you're lying down. So your heart's not having to do two jobs. It's just working on the muscles, not having to compensate for you being upright against gravity. So you can build your strength in lying and then transfer it up into standing. The last thing that we try and do once you're stable is we encourage cardiovascular activity. Once you're stable, it's the last thing we would suggest. One of the ways we do that is you can see on the screen there, there's some static bike pedals and I get my patients to use them in lying. So again, the heart can concentrate on getting the blood to their legs and to their quadriceps, the big muscles, rather than getting it to their brain as well. So we just sort of divide and conquer. We're doing the one job, not both of them simultaneously. As you get better at being on the bike, you can then come up into sitting and then you could start, start doing more walking. See if that helps. I use walking as your outcome measure. Am I able to walk a little bit more, a little bit further? Hope that is um, clear and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, and happy to take questions. Thank you very much both. That was absolutely fascinating. I think so many good tips and so much useful information for people to take away and kind of try and digest. I think it's really useful that we can record the sessions with your permission because I think it's people really like to be able to go back and actually listen again. Um, somebody did ask if you'd be willing to share the slides. Is that possible? That's fine. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. OK, so we will um, circulate those um, maybe via Facebook and our newsletter um, shortly after in the next few days or so. Right, though. So we had loads of questions. I've tried to have a look at the ones that you've been answering live. So we'll try not to have any duplication. Um, so let's have a look. Um, what are your opinions on patients who choose to use wheelchairs? That, um, some people claim that it improves their quality of life, but my doctor says it can lead to decondi deconditioning. So what are your views on that? So I think Vicky just answered that actually in her talk and that the reality is there's a time and place where wheelchairs can, um, as you say, improve people's quality of life. And that is really important quality of life. So providing you use it in that context and not necessarily all the time, 
but you, if you if you're not able to get out your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller whereas if you're able to get out be it in a wheelchair it allows you to do more it improves your mental health and it will allow you to be more positive about um, everything that's happening you know to you physically so I, I, that my view is do what you need to do to carry on with your life Vicky no I completely yeah I completely agree I think it's we know there's an exercise intolerance here and um we do want you to be as fit as you can be but there's a limiting factor here but just as Julia has has said you've got a quality of life that you need to maintain so if that means you can go out and you can visit the people you want to and you can go and have the meals you want to and go to the cinema use your wheelchair if as long as you're not doing I'm avoiding standing up all the time brilliant no just keep, keep use use what you need to do to to live the life the way you need to live it with quality okay brilliant thank you um a couple of questions around the best way to get people to understand the level of fatigue and another one where somebody's partner gets frustrated that they have low energy levels but then they're they're able to throw everything into a work project for example so how to make people understand you well, know i think that um, one of the things i would suggest is showing people the graphs that were in my talk and Vicky's talk, because, you know, thinking about it in the context of a, a pie of energy and, you know, your pie as somebody with pots is smaller than my pie. That's the way it is at the minute. But, you know, you choose to use up your pie to do things. Now that might be, you use all of it to do a, a work project today, but means there's nothing left in that pie of energy to allow you to do anything else. Um, and, you know, we then talk about borrowing it from the following day. But then if you've got something important that you want to do on Sunday, you might actually save pie up in order to do that. And people start to manage their energy levels like that. And that's when you when you get to that point where you're managing it, that's beginning to get to a baseline that you're, you're understanding. And from there, you can begin to do more positive. So trying to you know show people in your family the slides show them the information on the pots uk website uh, the more people that understand who live with you and are around you the better your quality of life will be they don't care what people think that's <laughs> i have so many people who come into clinic who feel you know feel so bad that they can't go and visit their mother-in-law at christmas and it's sort of like who cares you know just do what gives you pleasure and um, you know she, oh, but she'll think badly of me who cares you, only you so stop using energy worrying about things that don't really matter yeah i think what you said about um acceptance i think that is like the biggest challenge probably um and then having to then think try and take into co um, consideration everybody else's feelings is yeah. Just, yeah, too much. So, okay, thank you for that. Um, we've had a question on the, a couple of questions about the fact that NICE have removed their recommendations for graded exercise in CFS and ME. Um, yeah, what so, are your... Uh, yeah, thanks, Joe. because I, I tried to put something in the chat about this and, and the person who put it in is absolutely right. We don't use graded exercise therapy. Um, so that's a very protocol-driven um, uh, intervention. So um, the, you're absolutely right. The... Um, NICE guidelines are now in the draft and no longer recommending graded exercise therapy. We have never used graded exercise therapy. Our approach is very individualized. So it's, it's not about you follow a, a, a path that you're on, a, 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 um, that everybody's on. Um, everybody is individualized in terms of their management. And it's about um, finding um, things in your life that allow you to um, create a baseline and then we increment, so I, I was, it was a mistake using the word graded because it has connotations. We increment your activity and you know, 10% of two seconds of standing up is, is a very small amount. It's not a set amount. It's about a, a, in, in your mind thinking about, well, I'm gonna try and do a little bit more today. And we say, you know, try and do 10% more than you, today than you did yesterday. Um, so, you, yeah, I hope that's reassured people that we are not and would not recommend graded exercise therapy. Um, yeah. 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's been a couple of questions about um, are there any particular types of exercise you'd recommend more so than others? And um, one person's asked that um, said that they've been suggested that people with POTS shouldn't do yoga. And is this true? Mm. Should I take this one? Because it's yes. everyone, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, um, <laughs> right, dive in. Um, so Jim Simmons did some lovely research if you what helped. And things that came up were walking helped, Pilates, so postural control muscle work would help, swimming helps, which I completely get because swimming, you're horizontal in the water, the blood's just flowing, you've got some hydrostatic pressure. There's lots of reasons why that would help. The help for different reasons, so your... Your Pilates type work is going to work those muscles that act as hinges. It's going to help your movement quality. Your swimming will help a little bit of your movement quality, but more co it's going to be a better cardiovascular challenge, which is great. Yoga, it depends on the type of yoga. Um, again, Hot pod or something like that would just yeah, be it. Yeah. And, and <laughs> anything that raises you, you know, might drop your blood pressure. You can imagine. Yeah. So, so I can understand yoga being on a list of things to avoid, um, but from a physiological point of view. But, but for me, it's about finding something that gives you pleasure. Absolutely. Um, and if, if you find something that um, isn't Pilates and isn't swimming, but you enjoy it and you, you, you would want to do more of it if you could, then that's the key. Somebody put in the chat they want to swim the channel tunnel. And they have to be able to do it by August. Well, you know, no. no, no. So you know, and I know that'll be devastating to whoever is. But we hear that all the time in the clinic. I've got this goal. I've got to do. I've got to. You know, I'm an England um, rower, or I'm a I'm a an England um, you know rugby player, and I've got to get to the Six Nations. And you sort of it's just. You know, stop giving yourself such a hard time about it. Just, you know, take a step back and, and give yourself the opportunity to repair um, and set realistic goals. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, we've had quite a few. Sorry if I am duplicating anything you've said. I was so busy trying to get the questions into some sort of order. So apologies if there's any duplication. Um, does any medication help with fatigue in POTS? There's um, no there's... evidence for any any medication um, being um, a value in pots above and beyond um, random. Uh, there's no uh, there's case studies, but there's no randomised controlled trials, which is the gold standard. So we try and avoid using medicines if we can, because um, in surveys we've done, fifty percent of people who start on medicines feel worse um, because of side effects from the medicines. This isn't um, a disease where medicines will cure it the medicine because we don't know what causes it so there are no curative medicines there are only medicines that give you symptomatic benefit so they might control your palpitations um, or they might control one element of the symptoms that you're experiencing but that unfortunately as yet we don't have treatments that are curative and we don't have treatments that that specifically treat the fatigue. Um, sometimes we get people who um, are dropping their blood pressure um, with POTS who um, will put on treatment to increase their blood pressure and that helps the fatigue. But, but there isn't anything that we routinely use. Okay, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, we had a question emailed in about any tips for improving sleep. I don't know if that's something that you would cover so Kate um, looks at sleep with people and we often ask people to fill in sleep diaries and um, we ask them to do simple things like um, uh, what's called sleep hygiene. Um, so make sure you go to bed at, a, uh, at a, the same time every night and get up at the same time. So however tired you feel, get up and out of bed. If you start finding that your biological clock is changing or get you sleeping for longer periods of time that it's really important to try and address that if you can um, and um, making sure that you do all the things that you probably have seen on the telly you know don't have lots of caffeine before you go to bed at night try and not use screens if you can 
relax in a hot bath before you go to bed, oh, perhaps not for pots anyway, um, but, you know, trying to um, do all the things that might help you get into sleep. If you've got twitchy legs, so what's called restless leg syndrome, there are medicines that can help with that. And that's people who have jerky legs in the couple of hours before they go to bed at night. Um, so there are medicines that improve that. Sleep apnea is the other thing we sometimes um, find in patients with fatigue, which, you know, if you've got a partner, ask them, do you snore and do you have periods where you stop breathing? Um, but, you know, working on that biological clock is really important. And the other thing is trying not to nap during the day. So if you do, uh, if you are somebody who, when, who rests and lies down, um, try and not nod off if you possibly can. And if you do nod off, don't sleep for longer than 40 minutes um, because there is a little bit of evidence that if you sleep for longer than that 40 minutes, you have more brain fog than, um, than if you keep it to less than 40 minutes. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, somebody's asked, is it a reasonable expectation to ever completely eliminate the fatigue, the fatigue symptom if you have POPs? Um, I would always set my standards very low because if your standards low, your, your expectations low, you're never going to be disappointed. It's going to be something that's there forever and we need to learn to manage around it. So expect that you'll have some element of fatigue, but expect that your skill level will improve so it's a, a more manageable. I think, I think that's more reasonable than to get rid of it altogether. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, do you find that mental health issues can impact on fatigue and perceived energy levels? And how would you be able to identify this? So, um, yes, so there are primary um, mental health issues. So people who have bipolar depression or psychosis, et cetera, who have POTS because you know, mental health, primary mental health issues are very common. And um, the medications that people are on for primary mental health issues and um, the um, associated um, uh, problems that go along with that can be exhausting and lead to fatigue. So um, people who've got a mental health diagnosis may um, get POTS and may suffer problems. But there are clearly secondary, what's called reactive mental health problems associated with having any chronic illness. So people will often get reactive depression and anxiety. And, and, and um, as a result, um, those are both exhausting. If you're very, very anxious about leaving the house, you know, what might happen if um, that those levels of anxiety impact on your sleep, the impact of, upon your um, ability to function and as a result will make people more fatigued so we do often um, ask GPs to put people on antidepressants and that can sometimes cause people hopefully not in our clinic but in some environments concerns that people don't believe them they think their symptoms are not real that's not the case it's it's about managing symptoms to see whether we can improve your quality of life and if anxiety and reactive depression are there, then if we can improve that, that will give you more energy to allow you to do more. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, where else are we? Um, so we've had a couple of questions on uh, COVID, which I just, you couldn't possibly get through any, any conversation at the moment without it, because... It's our whole life, isn't it, at the moment, it seems. So, again, I'm not sure if these are questions that you will be happy or comfortable to answer, but um, I had COVID early in the pandemic, and I don't know if I have long COVID as my fatigue started after this, but my doctor says it's just my POTS and won't, con won't consider long COVID. Should I keep pushing them? Uh, well, there are two reasons to keep pushing them. Um, the first reason is to help you understand what's happened to you. And the second is because there are, um, wrongly or rightly, new clinics for long COVID. And um, so in turn, uh, people, some people have put in the chat, you know, are there clinics like ours elsewhere in the country? And there are a few, but there are a lot of long COVID clinics. And if you can access support through a long COVID clinic, 
that is valuable to you and gives you skills to manage your symptoms that ultimately improves your quality of life, then being able to access that because you are labelled with long COVID um, may be helpful to you. So, you know, in some ways, being given that label does give you great access to support. Um, so, you know, I think long COVID at the minute is is a good thing. Um, it, the fact that fatigue is associated with it because it's changing clinicians' perception of fatigue as a symptom and chronic fatigue syndrome, ME particularly, um, is putting a really different lens on what people have been experiencing largely unrecognized for many, many years. So um, it, uh, that has been something that has been long overdue and, and potentially very helpful for the community. So um, let's hope they continue to invest in those clinics. Okay, brilliant, thank you. And then I think one final question, um, looking ahead to the summer, which I can't wait for, <laughs> um, there's someone saying that they build up exercise during the winter and spring, but then crash really hard during the summer. And they're only able to kind of restart exercising once they hit winter again. So somebody here that's not looking forward to the summer as much. Um, how, how can that be managed? Have you got any tips there? Um, it's almost in reverse because a lot of people we see um, and lots of older populations can exercise through the summer and reverse it in the winter. So I think it's, we see that fluctuation, you can see it, go with it to what, to what you can. You'll be building over the winter and hopefully each winter you'll, so take a longer view of it. Is it that each winter you're a little bit better? So you are building some resource and do your summers get easier as a consequence? And that might take several years to be able to see. Um, and what, what things can you do? So again, I think Julia, Julia's already said, you know, find the things that you enjoy doing, but do you have to change what you do in the summer a little bit? If, you, if your priority is to maintain fitness, is it that, you know, you can get in a pool of water and a pool of water, you can exercise a little bit more effectively. It cools you down a little bit. You've got a bit more vasoconstriction. It's sort of changing your routine summer to winter I think I don't know if that helps because I think it's so individual and it might be you hate the water and you don't like swimming in which case that's not going to work and they might just have to ride it out and, and work out other ways to try and just maintain or lessen that deterioration over the summer but it's a, it's a tricky one because POTS patients do really struggle in the in the summertime when it's so warm yeah absolutely Okay, well, thank you both so much. I mean, I think this is our best attended webinar um, that we've had to date. Uh, I think it just shows that there's such a thirst for knowledge about it and people just in real need of support. I know that everybody's going to be going away wishing that we had your sorts of clinics all over the country. So fingers crossed that we will, you know, be getting, getting there. Um, but thank you both so much for giving up your time. Is there anything that you've seen from the question box or the chat box that you want to address before we finish? No, no, it's been great. I've enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everybody who's attended. Thank you for all the lovely questions. I'm really sorry if we didn't get to your specific question, but hopefully we'll have covered um, kind of a range of topics. Um, it, like I said at the beginning, it's really helpful if you can just fill in the very short questionnaire um, that you'll get the link to at the end. That would be really great. Um, and I will email the slides out in the next couple of days. This will be up on YouTube. Um, and just thank you again to Professor Newton and Victoria. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that was great. Brilliant. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone.